In this video, we're going to give an overview of cyclic loading, otherwise known as fatigue. Cyclic loading is common in many engineering applications where load or stress reversals are common. So examples might be in the axle of a car or in the fuselage of an airplane as it is pressurized and depressurized. One of the earliest studies on cyclic loading was conducted on railroad wheel axles. In this study, they applied different amounts of cyclic stress and determined the number of cycles to failure. And what they determined was that as the stress decreased, the life increased, but that at some point actually the uh, life remained unchanged. So it essentially appeared that you could do an infinite number of cycles to failure below some stress. The other thing that was determined from this study was that in samples that started out with a notch, the fatigue life was much lower. So two outcomes of this is that um, a property known as the fatigue limit was determined, and that's essentially the stress or number, number of cycles that, that sort of matches that stress below which we don't expect failure to occur from fatigue. So the fatigue limit and the second is that this study which looked at the effect of a notch on fatigue life and the fact that the life dramatically decreases when the notch is present suggests that fatigue happens in a three-step process. And those three steps are crack initiation, so the crack has to first form, then crack propagation, and then fracture. And so the fact that there is a notch present, that would uh, dramatically increase the rate of the crack initiation stage. So both in this video and the videos that follow here, we will talk about uh, not only the steps of fatigue fracture, but also the relationships between the stress and the number of cycles to failure the ways that we describe fatigue cycles and so on. So let's move on and look at the effect of different loading configurations on fatigue life. So in fatigue uh, or cyclic loading, we need to know the maximum stress that's being applied. We need to know the minimum stress that's being applied in this cycle. And essentially the fate of the component will depend a great deal on the maximum and minimum stress and the relationship between them. Now, in this figure here, uh, this loading is represented in a sinusoidal form, and sometimes that's how it actually plays out in application. Sometimes a triangular waveform is what we're dealing with, sometimes a trapezoidal waveform, uh, and sometimes something irregular. But the relationships that we will derive here will apply no matter what the waveform. So we're interested in essentially the range of stress. So this value delta sigma, and that is illustrated right here. That's given by just the sigma max minus sigma min. We're also interested in the mean stress. So that is sigma m, the mean stress. And it's defined as sigma max plus sigma min divided by two. And we'll talk later about how important the mean stress is on determining the fatigue life. The next value that we're interested in is this sigma a, which is essentially the stress amplitude. The stress amplitude is defined as sigma max minus sigma min divided by 2. So note that in the mean stress, we have a plus in the equation, and in the amplitude, we have a minus in the equation. So it will depend also on sort of, is this cycling happening entirely in tension, entirely in compression, or is it being reversed between tension and compression? And it would be helpful to have some single parameter which gave us some sense of what the cycle was like. And we 
for that purpose, define the stress ratio R. And R is defined as sigma min divided by sigma max. So let's just take a look at a couple of examples to see how this works out for different loading conditions. So let's consider this triangular waveform here that cycles back and forth between no stress and a tensile stress of 60 MPa. And we want to calculate uh, delta sigma and then the mean stress, the stress amplitude, and the stress ratio. So the delta sigma, or the stress range, is just 60 minus 0, 60 MPa. In this example, the mean stress is found as 60 plus 0 divided by 2 equals 30 MPa. And we can represent that up here. Now we can find the stress amplitude. In this case, the stress amplitude is also equal to 30, but we can see that value on here essentially as this range. This is the stress amplitude. And the last thing is to calculate R, the stress ratio. So in this case, we find that the value of R is equal to 0. And it will always be equal to 0 if we have essentially a 0 to full tension loading situation. So if it starts at 0, it doesn't really matter how high up the stress goes. That value of R will always be equal to 0. Let's consider one other waveform. Let's consider now a wave which goes from 30 MPa in tension to 30 MPa in compression. And again, let's start with our stress range. So this loading configuration also has a stress range of 60 MPa. Let's find the mean stress next. In this case, though, the mean stress we find is equal to 0. And we see that right here on the stress axis. Now let's look at the stress amplitude. As in the first example, we find again that the stress amplitude is equal to 30. And so these have the same stress range and they have the same stress amplitude, although they have a different mean stress. The mean stress was higher in the first case. And let's just finish now by finding the value for the stress ratio. So in this case, we find a stress ratio equal to negative 1. And a stress ratio equal to negative 1 will actually always be the case when we have sort of the same amount of stress in tension as we do in compression. So that's what a value r equals negative 1 corresponds to. So we see these had the same stress range, they had the same stress amplitude, but we can get a sense of what the profile really looked like when we compare either the mean stresses or the stress ratios. So let's take a look now and see what might the fatigue lifetime look like as a function of the stress amplitude. So as a function of this parameter here, how would the fatigue life look? So this is the kind of plot that would result if you measured the number of cycles to failure for a number of different experiments. So using different stress amplitudes or different strain amplitudes. But, but right now let's focus on different stress amplitudes. So we're measuring the stress amplitude. We're, we're uh, recording the number of cycles to failure. Note that this is in a log-log plot. And we notice here the endurance limit, or this is what I called before the fatigue limit. And so we can uh, notice that on this ratio. Um, if there is not an endurance limit uh, for a material or, or that's specified, then uh, 10 to the 7 cycles is what's used. Another important thing to note on here is sort of these two different regions of behavior which are marked out here. And so this one that says LCF, that stands for low cycle fatigue. In the low cycle fatigue region, we notice that the slope here of the sigma A versus NF is somewhat uh, lower. 
So that means that a small change in the stress amplitude results in a bigger change in the number of cycles to failure. This is in comparison to this HCF region here, and this is high cycle fatigue. So this is called high cycle fatigue because it's in the higher number of cycles to failure, whereas this is low cycle fatigue because it's a smaller number of cycles to failure. As we will see in the following video, high cycle fatigue is typically uh, stress controlled, or the stress is what's the same on each cycle, and low cycle fatigue is usually driven by a strain controlled deformation. And we'll go into why that is and how these curves look in more detail there. So the last thing to consider here for this video is what the effect of mean stress would be on a stress uh, life plot like this. So let's take a look at that. So we want to consider the effect of mean stress. And we did those two examples before where we had uh, one stress loading profile like this, and we had one stress loading profile like this. These are both stress versus time. And they had the same stress amplitude and stress range, but different mean stresses. And so now we want to know essentially what is the effect of that mean stress on the lifetime. So if we plot essentially the stress amplitude as before, versus the number of cycles to failure for some particular uh, mean stress. Let's say we'd have a, a plot that maybe looks like this. So this is really just showing the high cycle fatigue region. And let's say that this is with some particular mean stress one. So if we have a lower mean stress, we end up with a higher number of cycles for any given stress. So this would be at mean stress number two, which is less than mean stress number one. So essentially for any stress amplitude, the lower the mean stress, the higher the lifetime. And so uh, we have in this video looked at how we characterize the stresses at play in a fatigue environment and looked at the effect of mean stress and also how fatigue behavior changes with the number of cycles.